We're having lunch. Okay. All right. So uh, we've been going through a series in the book of Jude, and um, we are. I know it seems like we're taking a long time to get anywhere because this morning we're actually going to just look at verse 4, uh, but uh, we will definitely pick up some more steam. Say, how can you preach in one chapter for so many weeks? I don't know. I'm just bringing it to you as the Lord has led. So uh, let's stand uh, for the reading of God's Word. I'll read it uh, since we're all wearing masks except for me. I'll read it, uh, but I, I still want to stand out of respect for the Scriptures. Uh, that's how we, we do that at our church. It's not a command, uh, but it's more of a tradition, I guess. Custom, culture, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I'll read uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 4. And then after that, I'll pray and then we'll be seated. Jude chapter 1 verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we continue in our study through the book of Jude, as we look at the, the things that are given to us in your word, help us to be wise. Help us, Lord, as we learn these things to apply them to our own lives and our own walk. And as we see how the wicked are, let us purpose in our hearts not to be that way as we see the false teachings and the false doctrines of those who claim to be your children but are not, that we'll be wise in following our leadership, our spiritual leadership, in as much as they follow you. We want to thank you for your grace, and I pray, Father, you'd help me to preach in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Now, I don't know if you noticed... If you've ever read through the book of Jude, I think it would be kind of hard not to notice how Jude uses so many examples from the Old Testament. Talks about all kinds of things. He's clearly a man of the Word. And he knew how the Word was to be applied. And this is something that we could learn for ourselves. He refers to Egypt and the destruction of the unbelievers in the wilderness, he talks about fallen angels and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He draws some lessons for us from the lives of Cain and from Balaam and from Korah. He's quite skilled, actually, if you read it, in applying the Old Testament scriptures to the present crisis that he saw. On top of this, Jude also uses a couple of writings that were not in the Old Testament. If you've read through the book of Jude, you know he talks about the body of Moses. He refers to Michael the archangel disputing with the devil about the body of Moses. And you can find that in verse 9. Well, that actually comes from a non-canonical book called the, the Testament of Moses. And some, sometimes it's also called the Assumption of Moses. Uh, they have determined that, that both of those are probably the same book. I don't know. I've not read either one. Uh, but anyway, um, as I researched that to try to find out more about this book, I found out that the earliest evidence of this book, the Testimony of Moses or the Assumption of Moses, the earliest evidence actually comes from an incomplete 6th century Latin manuscript. An incomplete, meaning we don't, we don't have the whole thing, it's from the 6th century, and it's in Latin. Very clearly, Jude, who wrote in the 1st century, was not using that one. All right? Obviously, Jude would, would, Jude would have been quoting from uh, Hebrew or Greek. Um, we don't have any Latin manuscripts from the 1st century, as far as I know. Uh, if you know of anything, let me know after the service. I have to add that to my book on his next revision. That'd be cool. But anyway, as far as I know, none of that existed in the first century. So Jude would have used either a, a Hebrew or a Greek manuscript. And we don't have any copies of that. So basically, it doesn't exist. All right? Some guy in the 1800s did a translation of what was in the Latin, and that's been published. And you can probably buy that or find it online somewhere. Um, so that, that's the, the story behind what he quotes from the Assumption of Moses. He also uses 
a quote from the book of Enoch in verses 14 and 15 where he talks about uh, Enoch uh, who prophesied saying that the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints and then the next verse to execute judgment upon all that are ungodly of all their ungodly deeds and so on. So he's quoting from the book of Enoch and there are supposed copies of this book that are out there. If you've got the internet, if you've got Google, you can find some of that out there. But there's a lot of disputation as to whether or not it is even genuine or not. There's a lot of argument about that. Um, uh, bottom line is it's, it's not in the Bible. It's a canonical book. So Jude used two outside sources along with the Old Testament and many of the stories that we find there in writing the book of Jude. So what's my point? Why am I telling you all of that? Oh, it's great information to know. Well, maybe. But, you know, I'm a preacher. Maybe you think that I'm not a very good one or maybe you think I'm a great one. It doesn't matter. All I know is that in my lifetime, I have literally prepared and preached thousands of times. Uh, I was sitting there thinking last week how many thousands of times. I don't know. I really don't. Uh, but thousands of times. And as I prepare a sermon, I go to the scriptures to prepare the message. Then I go to other sources sometimes for illustrations or to emphasize certain points. And uh, it looks to me like this is what Jude is doing. It looks to me like he is writing out a sermon. His main text of his sermon comes from 2 Peter chapter 2. And he has thrown in a couple of you know, applicable illustrations from Enoch and, you know, the testimony or the assumption of Moses. But basically, it appears to me to be a fiery sermon in print. I, I, as I read through the book of Jude, there's lots of doctrine in it, so don't misunderstand me. But I don't think it's meant to be a doctrinal treatise. I think it's meant to be a fiery discussion, an expose, if you will, uh, his identity and his description of the actions of apostasy. In the very beginning, in verse 4, he gives us, well, really, verses 1 through 4, he kind of gives us his introduction, if you will, to his sermon. And he gives us six points, which I'll go over one by one through the course of our message. You can see those, if you will, Look at your bulletin. You can see all six of those points where he tells us that there are, and these are all, by the way, in verse 4. So we're never even going to get out of verse, well, we will. We'll go to other places, but mainly we'll be in verse 4 this morning. But we find out that there are certain men. We find out that they are creeping men. We also learn that they are condemned men. Then they are corrupted men. Then they are carnal men. And then lastly, they are controverting men. If you don't know what the controvert, the word controvert means to deny something, okay? I needed another C. I had five C's. I needed, I needed a sixth one. And controvert is a good word. So they're controverting men. So if you don't know the word, there it is. It's an English word. Somebody actually uses it somewhere. I don't usually use it, but there it is, all right? So with that, let's look at verse 4 one more time as we consider these six thoughts. Jude Chapter 1, verse 4. For there are certain men, crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So the very first thing we find out is that there are certain men. Time and again, the Bible warns us that there are those who would seek to destroy God's people. There are certain men, certain men who are built or bent on corrupting the church and building their own kingdom. They existed in Jude's day, and if they existed in Jude's day, I am certain that they exist today. In fact, if you wanted, you could make a list of names. People that you know are apostates who claim to be Christians on the surface, and yet we know that from the doctrine that they preach or the life that they lead, that they certainly are not. And that list could be very long. A Jew doesn't list names. But personally, I don't really have a problem with listing names. Uh, if certain men 
came to Kunsan City and they were going to use the, you know, the soccer stadium down there or maybe the art hall across the street or whatever to have a big gathering. And posters were up all over the city that, uh, you know, a Joel Osteen or somebody like that was coming to town. You'd better believe that I would tell you not to go. I would warn you that they are not preachers of the gospel. They preach another Jesus. They preach another gospel. I would warn you of these certain men. And I do not believe that it is wrong to do that. Um, 2 Timothy. Turn to 2 Timothy. Let me share some verses with you from the book of 2 Timothy. Because I like the way that Paul does this in 2 Timothy. You, you'll meet people today that say, well, you don't have to mention their names. You just preach against their doctrine. Well, sometimes it is necessary. And that's why I said if they came to Kunsan City and put posters up, I would warn you. I would tell you not to go. But Paul does this in 2 Timothy. Notice in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Paul writes and he says, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Homogenes. He names two guys in chapter 1 who resisted his ministry. He named them. Turn to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Paul writes and he says, And their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrown the faith of some. So now here he mentions two men, Hymenaeus and Philetus. He names two more men. He named two in chapter 1. He names two in chapter 2. There's nothing wrong with naming names when it's appropriate and necessary to do so. Turn to chapter 3. In this case, he names two guys that have been long dead by the time that Paul wrote. And he uses them as an example. And so in chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, Now as Jonas and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So, again, he mentions Jonas and Jambres, two more men. We're three chapters into a four-chapter book, and we've already got six bad guys on our list. Turn to chapter 4. Chapter 4, look at first verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is and departed unto Thessalonica. So he names Demas there. No real reason to do so, as far as I can see in the context. Nobody asked him about Demas. But he's making a point of his particular condition in the prison being alone and explaining where all his workers had gone. And when he gets to Demas, he says, Demas hath forsaken me. Demas didn't just leave. He forsook. He, Paul said, loved this present world. That's not a happy phrase to have somebody say about you. He loves the world and has departed unto Thessalonica. Then skip down to verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. God will get you, Alexander. Two more men in chapter 4. So we got two in chapter 1, two in chapter 2, two in chapter 3, two in chapter 4. You can do your math. Two times 4 is 8. In four chapters, he gives us a list of eight people that Paul said was resisting the ministry of the gospel. Jesus had no problems naming names. In his case, he didn't just name names, he blasted a whole group. You know, so why do you have to talk bad about the Mormons? Why do you have to talk bad about the Jehovah's Witnesses? Why do you have to say anything about the Seventh-day Adventists? Why do you have to do this and why do you have to do that? When it's necessary, I'm going to do it. And by the way, you might not think it's necessary, but if I feel it's necessary, I'm still going to do it. All right? But notice what Jesus does in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 15. Matthew 23 and verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. He names two well-known groups of their day. Hypocrites. He didn't, you know, walk around like he was on eggshells here. He just came right out. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more, the child of hell than yourselves. That's pretty straight. That's pretty blunt. Look at verse 24. He goes on and he says, Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Look at verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. So Jesus didn't have any problems naming names. Very clearly said the scribes are hypocrites. Very clearly said the, 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 uh, the Pharisees are hypocrites. He didn't have any problem doing that. Sometimes it is necessary to name names. The point is, when you see these certain men, call them out. Warn the sheep that there is a wolf in sheep's clothing in the midst. I'll never forget 19, I think it was 1987. I was, um, I was, you know, a, a military guy at that time, a, a guy at the Haven, Sunday school teacher, preacher from time to time when Brother Stewart gave me opportunity to do so. And uh, he had a situation come up in the States and it was going to require him to be gone for about a month. So he says, Brother Jim, you got it. Here's the keys. You got it. It's your church for a month. And he left. Got on the plane. Gone. All right. Remember that we are talking about the days before Internet. We were talking about the days when you didn't send somebody a text. When you didn't call somebody because for one minute in those days, one minute on the phone cost over $4 in 1987. One minute. So if I were going to call him and talk for just five minutes, you can do the math, the bill starts getting pretty big pretty quick. Oh, and by the way, the connections weren't all really all that great either. You could get two minutes into your phone call, finally get them on the line, suddenly the line drops dead, and you start all over. It was horrible. So if somebody lived in another country, you wrote them a letter. He's only gone for two weeks, however, and maybe the letter would get there, and maybe not, because we are talking 1987, things were not that great. All right? So there was really no way for me to contact him about any need. So truly, I was in charge for a month. And I had to be the guy to make the calls. The very next week after Brother Bill left, one of the guys that were coming at that time, which everyone considered to be a bit odd for various reasons, though we couldn't put our fingers on it, he started passing out literature that was heretical. And I don't mean just a different point of view. I mean anti-gospel heretical. He was passing it out. And when I saw it happening, I gathered it all up and I went to him and I gave it to him. I said, look, you can't pass this stuff out here. And if you have any desires of bringing people over to your position here, you can't come. And so he, of course, said, okay, I won't. And he stopped passing it out. And he didn't come for like three weeks. And then the week before Brother Stewart came back, he showed up again. And I went to Brother Bill the very next week and I said, we have a wolf in our midst. And he said, Why? who is it? So I explained to him who it was and what the problem was. And he said, okay. And he handled it from there. I don't know what he did. You know, I wasn't in charge anymore. But it would be wrong for me to know that there was a wolf among the sheep and not tell somebody. That would be wrong. Jude is pointing this out. That there can be times when there will be certain men. Call them out. Protect the church. And by the way, protect yourself. There are certain men. Secondly, they are creeping men. Again, referring back to Jude chapter 1 verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. They're creeping men. They creep in unawares. False teachers, apostates, whose sole desire is to corrupt the body of Christ, they do not announce their arrival. They do not walk in and say, I am here and I believe salvation by works and I'm going to teach you that. 
They don't do that. They come in very subtly. In fact, they would rather you not even notice their entrance. Paul warns the Ephesian leadership that this sort of thing was going to happen. He doesn't say it might happen. He speaks as if it will happen. Jude does the same thing. He says, there are certain men crept in unawares. He doesn't say they are coming. He says they are here. Notice what Paul says in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. If you remember our first message, we kind of looked at this a little bit. But notice what he says in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. He says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Why after Paul's departing? Well, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I, you know, I know this. I read this in uh, another first century document somewhere. But Paul carried a 12-gauge shotgun under his garments. And if he saw a false teacher, he'd give him one warning. Get out. I start shooting in 30 seconds. So they waited until Paul left. Okay, everyone can laugh now. That was a joke. Ha ha. Moving on. Paul said, after my departing, after the one who would know, after the one who had authority, after the one who could warn them, when he departed, what's going to happen next? Grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Verse 30. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. You know, I, I've seen some church splits. They are ugly. I've seen churches split for reasons that, you know, I thought were just silly. Fighting over things like the color of curtains or whatever. And people get mad and the church splits over things like that. I've also seen church splits over doctrine. Where someone in the church will begin to teach a doctrine that the church formerly did not believe. And then they gather a circle around them, a group of people to support them in that. And the next thing you know, then there is an uprising, a rebellion, if you will, where somebody says, no, this is what we believe and this is what we are going to do. And all of a sudden the church is in an uproar and the church ends up splitting and one group, you know, one guy takes his little group and they go off somewhere else. And what happens there? You say, well, it's better off. They purge the church. Well, the unfortunate thing about that is a lot of times poor, unwinning young Christians or Christians that just maybe they don't even know better, they get caught up in that and a lot of people get hurt. So before it ever gets starts, before it ever starts, Paul says, know this, it's going to happen. Keep your eyes open. There can be wolves. You need to know that. They creep in. They're not going to enter in there and, you know, slowly the they're going to come in, and at some point when they think it's safe to do so, they're going to rise up. They're not going to do it suddenly. They're not going to announce their presence. They don't want it to be known. They creep in. If you have the King James Bible, you can read in the first few verses or first few chapters of Genesis, and you'll find, and not just there, but in other places too, but it's kind of prominent there, you'll read about creeping things. You ever notice that? We don't need anybody to tell us what a creeping thing is. A creeping thing is a bug. It's a spider. It's an ant. It is something that crawls upon the ground that you don't want. A very few people that I know actually want spiders under their beds at night. I don't know of anybody that likes the idea of having ants in their kitchen. We don't like roaches. I don't know anybody that has roaches that they want. I met some people that have, you know, a tarantula, a spider for a pet. That's weird, but okay. You know, I've met people like that. That's weird, but okay. But I've never met one person that had a roach for a pet. We typically don't want them around. They're scurrying, little, slithering, disgusting creatures. Same thing with snakes, as far as I'm concerned. They like to hide. They hide from the light. And they come out, and they do their best work in the dark. If you think about it, the best poison is the poison that is hidden. The one that you don't know about. It's hidden very well. The poison that is virtually undetectable until it's too late. I've read news stories about, you know, uh, I remember 
reading a news story about a wife and she wanted to kill her husband. And so over the course of numerous weeks, she, she put little bits of poison in his food. Poison that the body doesn't get rid of very easily. It stocks it up. It stores it up. And in low amounts, didn't hurt him. But then he started getting sicker and sicker and sicker until at one point there was so much poison in his system, it killed him. And when they did the autopsy, they found out, and of course, she went to jail. That's the way apostates work. Little by little. A little drip here, a little drip there, until it starts to build up, until it kills you. That's what they do. They introduce it slowly. Their design is to take away your faith, to take away your freedom in Christ, and to put you back under bondage to whatever it is they believe. What is it that we believe that gives us freedom? We believe that we're saved by grace, not by works. Amen. We believe that we walk in faith, not in sight. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us liberty over sin and the flesh and the devil. That's what we believe. Amen. But they teach opposite to that. To try to bring us back under bondage. And who is it that they are going to influence? Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2 for a moment. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Because I, I want to explain this verse to you a little bit. Second Peter chapter two, verse fourteen. And again, in Second Peter, this is by the way the text that Jude used. And in Second Peter chapter two, verse fourteen, again speaking of false teachers, speaking of apostates, he says this in verse fourteen, having eyes full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. And I want to park right there. Beguiling unstable souls. The word beguile is a verb. Look it up. You say, but it says beguiling, and that can be an adjective. Not in this case. It is a verb. Look it up. This is what they do. They, they find an unstable soul. They come to church, and they sit around, and they go, oh, Dion. He's unstable. Don't anybody laugh. He doesn't know the Bible very well. He's not very strong in the faith. He would be an easy one to beguile. So they immediately begin working on Dion until they get Dion. Now that they have Dion, he looks around again. Ah, Chan, she's another unstable soul. We'll go for her next. And then after getting Dion and Chan, then he's going to go for another. Oh, there's Josh. Yeah, another unstable soul. We'll go after Josh. And then they get Josh. Until they get enough people to divide the church and destroy the local body of Christ. That's how they work. I'm not making this up. The Bible teaches this. And not only does the Bible teach it, in 36 years as a Christian, I've seen it happen again and again. It's real. The battle is real. It is out there. They beguile unstable souls. In other words, they prey on those that are immature. And there's, it's not a sin to be immature. If you just got saved last year, of course you're immature. You've got to grow in the faith like everybody else did. Babies don't naturally, you know, know how to walk. You've got to grow. So it's okay to be immature. And the older Christians in our midst ought to be helping the younger Christians so that they don't become fall prey. All right? We've got to make sure that we're protecting them from the wolves. The immature or the weak. You know, the ones who just, they got one foot in the church and one foot in the world. And, you know, they're the ones that are in trouble. They're the ones that the wolf is going to try to side up to. They're the ones that are unstable. Now, let's move on to the next point. They are certain men. They are creeping men. But we find out also in verse 4 that they are condemned men. Notice this. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. So Jude states that before of old, they are ordained to this condemnation. In other words, God has always known who these people were or who these people would be and that, they, that He had a reservation for them. They are reserved. They've got a reservation in hell 
from the very beginning. Now we're going to talk about the foreknowledge of God and sovereignty and all of that. Look, God is God. He knows everything. He has always known everything. He's always known who would be believers. And He's always known who is not going to be believers. He's always known who are going to be decent Christians. He's always known who are going to be false teachers and apostates. He's always known in His foreknowledge and His plan that His children were going to heaven and that the others were not. Does everybody follow this? Because there's a lot of people arguing today about the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. Look, don't argue with, you know, don't try to beat two doctrines against one another. The Bible teaches both. That's that, okay? Just deal with it. But the fact is, very clearly, Jude says that they were before of old ordained to this condemnation. God already knew what He was going to do with them. And just as God has sealed us unto salvation, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, in case you're interested, He has also sealed them to damnation. Their punishment is just as sure as our preservation. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. This is how Peter said it. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3 whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Let me say that again. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. I know some people like to twist words like ordain, you know, ordain to this condemnation, and twist it around to mean something that I don't think it's really meant to mean. But the word is very clear. Um, the word ordain, by the way, the Greek word is also translated as aforetime, written aforetime. Uh, Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime. Right there where it says written aforetime, it's the same Greek word. For whatsoever things were ordained, you know, written aforetime, uh, were written for... So the idea behind the word is that it is set in stone that those who are apostates have a reservation in hell. There is no other plan for them. That's it. That's what they got to look forward to. They are condemned. Now it's not that God made them to act that way. They chose their own course. God may have known what choice they would make, but they chose. It's just like my kids. If I offered them ice cream when they were kids, they were going to take it. Did they have a choice? Sure. But I knew what they were going to do. I knew. So the foreknowledge of God is really not that hard to understand. You know the character of the person you're talking to. You pretty much know if they're going to take the ice cream or not. It's pretty easy. But God has ordained that men who do act this way have a predestined place awaiting them. A reservation for them. What is ordained is not their choice but their punishment. That those who turn from God will not escape his righteous condemnation. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. That's what the Bible teaches. Now let's look at the next one. They are corrupted men. There are certain men, creeping men, condemned men, and corrupted men. Jude, again, chapter 1, verse 4, where he calls them ungodly men. Ungodly. And I think I said this in our introduction as well, that Jude uses the word ungodly six times in this letter. In verse 4, he refers to them simply as ungodly men. That's their character. That's what they are. They are ungodly men. Then you skip down to verse 15, and you find out that their works are ungodly, that their words and their motives are ungodly. Then you can go down to verse 18 and you'll find out that their desires are ungodly. And in the future, when we're studying those verses, I'll explain more about all of that. But the bottom line is they are totally depraved. They're ungodly men doing ungodly things, saying ungodly things, speaking hard speeches against the Lord. This is who they are. Totally depraved. Void of any ability or desire for true worship. And I want to pause for just a moment and remind you 
And we're not talking about people who might view some minor doctrine a bit differently than we do. You know, like there's some churches that they, they have a plurality of elders. They believe the Bible teaches that. And they've got their verses for that. Fine. I wouldn't argue with them. If they're convinced of that, great. That really has no impact on salvation. Nor does it have much of an impact on sanctification. That's all about church polity, if you will. All right? So that's fine. If that whole church believes that and they want to do that, that's fine. I wouldn't fight with them. I might not join there. I might join somewhere else that more in line agrees with what I believe from the Bible. But the fact is, they're not apostates. They're not even false teachers, really. I disagree with them. I think I'm right and I think they're wrong. Why are you looking at me funny? You think the same thing about everything you believe, right? We all think that way. But they're not apostates. So I want to draw a distinction here. We're not talking about people who might view some minor truth a bit differently. What we are talking about are those who hold doctrines that will damn your soul to hell if you believe it. That exists. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 again. 2 Peter chapter 2 in verse 1. This is where Peter begins his chapter on this stuff. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, and, I, and I, I want you to notice the contrast between the way he ends chapter 1. He ends chapter 1 by talking about holy men of God speaking as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, giving us the Word of God. And then in chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now get this next phrase who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. A heresy is a false teaching that is anti-gospel. That's what a heresy is. A damnable heresy means that that heresy will damn your soul to hell if you believe it. So if you believe, for example, that you are saved because you did what the church said, or you're saved because you helped a million little old ladies across the street. Or you're saved because you put in a million dollars in the offering on Sunday mornings. If you believe you're saved by works, you are lost. Bible doctrine tells us that we are saved by grace. We are saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's nice that you help little old ladies across the street. That's good. I'm sure they appreciate it. It's nice that you put a million dollars in the offering plate. I'm sure your church would appreciate it, but that won't get you into heaven. When, when God looks at you, and it's not going to happen this way, but just by way of illustration, if God looks at you and says, why should I let you into heaven? You're saying, Lord, have we not done good works? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we done many marvelous works, Lord? Surely that's good enough. By the way, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 tells us this. The Lord is going to look at you and say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He doesn't say, I knew you and forgot you. He said, I never knew you at all. You were never a child of God. Why? Because you put your faith in something other than the biblical doctrine, the true teaching of salvation by grace, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. His blood will wash you. You can't cleanse yourself. And if you believe something else, you're in trouble. That would be a damnable heresy. Keep in mind that the apostates aren't going to show you right out in the open what they want you to believe. They're going to lead you in little steps. They're going to keep it all a big secret. They're going to keep their sin in secret. They want you to believe that they're godly. They want you to think that they're good people and they're good Christians. And they're going to slowly start to influence you. But according to God's word, they're not godly. They're ungodly men. They're corrupted in their very character. Let's move on to the next point. They're carnal. You say they're corrupted. Of course they're carnal. Yeah, of course they're carnal. But notice how Jude brings it out. In Jude chapter 1, verse 4, he says, Ungodly men. Notice the next phrase. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And every time I read that, I, I just can't help but people that I've met, people that I've known, who thought that they could sin anytime they wanted to, who taught 
that sin didn't matter. In this case, they're turning the grace of God into this word, lasciviousness. Carnal men. In other words, they're taking that which is holy and they are twisting it into something that is offensive and sensual. That's what lasciviousness is. Lasciviousness is a sexual connotation. Look it up. That's the idea. And according to Galatians chapter 5, it is a work of the flesh. So every one of us in this room have the propensity within ourselves, because our flesh is still lost, we have the propensity within ourselves to produce this work, along with numerous others. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. He names them. That is a work of the flesh. By God's grace, I would hope that nobody, none of the believers in our church would ever get caught up in any of that. Either outwardly, where it's manifest, or even in your mind, even in your thought life. Keep it clean. If you can't keep it clean in your thought life, you're going to find your walk with the Lord will be greatly affected. And you're going to find your testimony at some point will be affected. You see, but nobody knows. Maybe they don't know that. But you're not witnessing the way you should. You don't have the joy of the Lord in your life the way you should. You don't have the kind of walk that is filled with Christ showing out of your life. Why? Because you're dealing with secret sin. That's a manifestation of the flesh. And it will affect you. There's no way around that. And then, according to Ephesians, lasciviousness is a sin that is overpowering. That will hold you captive. Get this in Ephesians 4.19. Again, describing, well, the very kind of people that we're talking about. It says this, who being past feeling, I mean, they're beyond the point of caring anymore about God or the truth. There's no conviction. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. So what does that mean? It means that that these people are going to pervert the commands of God by misapplying them or by, de or by denying them or just by ignoring them. That's what they're going to do. And that's why we have so many churches that are so carnal today. Churches that are mixed up in so many ways it's almost unbelievable. We've got homosexual churches. What is that? That's lasciviousness taken to the extreme. Carnality, licentiousness, all in the name of grace. You say, Pastor, it sounds like sounds like you hate homosexuals. No, I, I don't hate them. They're sinners like everybody else. They need to be saved just like everybody else. But the fact is, they've gone to an extreme in lasciviousness. And if you're on that road, you're saying, oh, I would never do that. That's disgusting. Well, maybe that's what you think. But lasciviousness is an overpowering sin. And it'll take you farther than you want to go. Believe me. Stay away from it. Their battle cry is... I'm not under the law. You ever heard that? We're not under the law anymore. I'm under grace. I have freedom in Christ. What a twisted, sick, and perverted way of presenting that. Because I read the New Testament just as well as the next guy, and I know what the New Testament says. It says, God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Yes. Lasciviousness doesn't fit in there. Neither does fornication or adultery or any other sin, really. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Yes, you are saved by grace. You are saved to serve. You're not saved to sin. That's not what the Bible teaches. And those that teach that, that is a lie of the devil. You must be holy as God is holy. The Bible commands it. But the apostate, he doesn't want you to read those verses. He doesn't want you to think about that. He doesn't want you to have a balance in your life. He wants you to be completely unbalanced in one way or the other, but He doesn't want you to be balanced. He wants you to follow Him in His way of teaching. He is bent on perverting worship so that we are now going to be worshiping the creature more than the Creator. 
Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Romans chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. And notice the sexual sensuality in these verses. By the way, if those words make you a little nervous, you might want to check up on why. All right? Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. That's where it comes from. To dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. The apostate does not serve God. He does not want you to serve God. He serves himself and he wants you to follow his ways. Let's move on to the last point. They are controverting men. Jude chapter 1 verse 4, the last phrase says that they are denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Controverting men. Denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They deny the Lord by both their doctrine and their deeds. By what they teach and by what they do. And in denying the Lord, they're really showing who they serve. It's true that there are some people and, you know, they'll try to creep into churches and, you know, try to destroy the church from the inside and, and get them to, to worship the devil. I've read cases where, you know, Satan worshipers have tried to, uh, tried to sneak into churches, but that rarely ever is effective. That is just so very clearly obvious the first time they open their mouths. Usually, those aren't the people we have to worry about. The ones that we have to worry about are the ones who pretend to be us. The ones who act like we do. Oh no, they, you know, they don't, you know, they don't smoke and they don't drink and they don't cuss and they don't do this and they don't do that. And you'll look at them outwardly and you will think, wow, what a nice guy that is. What a great Christian that guy is. And then, in the course of time, you start learning about what they're telling other people, about what they believe. Or you'll find out that in secret, they're not who they were in public. They deny the Lord. And in time, they begin to show who they really serve. They embody the spirit of the Antichrist. They deny the Lord, and they embody the spirit of the Antichrist. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The spirit of the Antichrist, really? Is it that bad? Yes, it's that bad. Look at this, 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. John writes and he says this, he says, Who is a liar? Who is a liar? Well, we're all liars, but he's speaking of a specific class of people here. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. So having said all of this, and gone through six different points of characteristics if you will there are certain men they're creeping men they're condemned men they're corrupted men they're carnal men they're controverting men how can we know who they are how can we know if one is an apostate or not well the bible gives us some certain tests and i want you to go to first john chapter four we're going to read verses one through six and then i'm going to refer back to these verses but i want you to remember first john chapter four this is where we find the test of apostasy. 1 John chapter 4. What's there? The test of apostasy. Now there's lots of nice stuff about love a little bit later. Starting in verse 7, we get a whole lot about love. But before we ever get to love, we get the test. 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but, what's the word? Right. Try. Try. Try the spirits. In other words, test them. Try is an old English word, which means to test it, to prove it. Try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So verse 1, we learn right away, John says, give them a test. Now he tells us what the test is, starting in verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come. And now 
and even now already is it in the world. Verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So here's the test. Let me give you the quick points. First of all, if they do not believe the incarnation or the deity of Christ. That's what he's talking about in verse 3. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's the incarnation. That is God, 100% God, 100% man, Jesus Christ. All right? That's what that is. That Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, is come in the flesh. If that person does not believe that, he is not of God. So in all of these churches all around the world that are twisting the humanity of Jesus or twisting the deity of Jesus in any way, they're not of God. The Bible says that. They're not of God. Let's move on. You, you know, as far as I know, in every cult that I've you know, taken a, a good look at, and I won't say a good hard look at, but just a look at, every cult will either pervert or deny or in some way twist the deity of Christ or the humanity of Christ. They, they, all, they all do that, as far as I know. You can give me a, a name of a cult and I can tell you what crazy thing that they have done with our Lord. For example, the, the Mormons, they believe that Jesus was a created being and the brother of Satan. They believe that. They say, what? Uh, it's a different message. Look it up. They believe that. All right? And we could go on and on. It's incredible that, that, that some of the things that the cults will do with the deity of Christ. You, you don't want to place, you know, they don't, they don't want you to put your faith in the real Jesus. They don't want you to be saved by the real gospel. They want you to follow another Jesus. They want you to place your faith in another gospel. They want you to actually believe that you have the truth when you don't. When you don't. I read somewhere that technology has gotten to the point now. We are so technologically advanced that they're actually going to produce, or maybe they already have, I don't know, a movie about Michael Jackson. Uh, you know, Michael Jackson died in 2000, what, 8, 7, 4, 13, I don't know. He died. It's been a while. They're making a movie about Michael Jackson doing some sort of concert, and it, it's, all, it's all a holograph. It's not real. It's not real. But it's going to look so real that they expect that people are going to pay money to go see it. Because it looks so real. Look, not everything that looks real is real. Give it the test. This book is your measuring stick. Measure it by this book. If it doesn't work, it's not real. Another test that you could give them is concerning their conversation and their lifestyle. Is it worldly? And not biblical. First John chapter 4 verse 5. Remember that? They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world. And the world heareth them. Sooner or later. Every snake will shed its skin. Somebody will come up to me later. And say well I know a snake that doesn't have skin. You get the point. Alright. Don't beat me up with your science. A snake sheds its skin. And you'll know that the snake is there. You can tell what is truly in the heart. Of any person. By what comes out of their mouth. The mouth is an expression of what's in your heart. If the world thinks highly of them, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Hey, if, if your favorite preacher or your favorite televangelist or your favorite social justice warrior, whoever it may be, they call themselves reverend whoever, if they're liked by CNN, you better start looking to see what they teach. All right? You better start measuring what they believe according to the scriptures. 
Because if the world thinks highly of them, they are not one of us. He said, that's pretty rough, brother. I mean, you know, pastor, I can think of some people. I can too. But verse 5 says, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Jesus said very clearly that, that, that they would receive them. He would re, they would be received of the world. But we're not. You can tell how reverend somebody is by the crowd that accepts them. Let me give you one last test and then we'll be done. If he will not listen to a real man of God, or more specifically, if he will not listen to the truth, as expressed in the scriptures. We saw that in verse 6. We are of God. John writes this as an apostle, as the authority. He writes this and he says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Hey, look. If a man cannot or will not be corrected by the scriptures, he is in grave danger. And he may very well be a false teacher or an apostate, mark it down. If someone cannot be corrected by the word, there are spiritual problems there. Mark that man and have no fellowship with him. That's what the scriptures teach. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I think I preached long and hard. I actually took one sermon and split it in two. This morning I was looking at my notes going, there is just no way I'm going to get through all of this. So be thankful that I did, I guess. But now is the, the time to deal with whatever the Lord has spoken to you about in your hearts. I have not really touched on sins of believers, but I think that the Holy Ghost, if He is faithful, and I know He is, He's probably spoken to your heart about something this morning. So as the piano begins to play, if God has spoken to you and dealt with you in any way, won't you come? Thank you.